950 feet is the minimum water level required for Lake Mead to continue generating power from Hoover Dam. And in the footage you are about to see, as the water drops closer to that threshold, unusual signs begin to appear, pointing toward a scenario many people have tried not to think about. At first glance, Lake Mead still has water. The dam is still standing. There are no sirens, no emergency alerts. Everything appears normal, at least to someone just passing by. But federal operational data shows that the largest reservoir in the United States is now being managed under conditions that are no longer familiar. Technical thresholds are being pushed. Low water plans have quietly been put into effect. So in the end, are the cracks exposed on the bottom of Lake Mead nothing more than harmless marks left by drought? Or are they signals of a larger system level breakdown beginning to take shape? Let's take a closer look. One, the cracks that shouldn't exist here. At first glance, what you are seeing can easily be placed into a familiar category of images. A reservoir running low, the lake bed exposed, cracks appearing after the water recedes. This is not something without precedent in the history of reservoirs across the American West. But Lake Mead's problem is not simply that the water is low. The problem lies in the timing and in the way these signs are appearing together. In this video, I do not want you to look at the images alone. I want you to follow three signals, three very different signals that align in a deeply unsettling way. The first is something anyone can recognize. The second is something many people scroll past because it does not feel dramatic. And the third is where the story moves away from emotion and into numbers, operating thresholds, and the way systems actually respond because when it comes to Lake Mead, the images are only the surface. What matters more are the assumptions the entire system has long been built on. The belief that low water levels are temporary, that dry years will eventually be offset, that the largest reservoir in the West always has enough room to adjust. But when those assumptions begin to be tested, the system does not respond with emotion. It responds with procedure, with classifications, with thresholds written into technical documents decades ago, designed to activate only after baseline conditions change for long enough. And this is where the story moves beyond a natural phenomenon. When a reservoir like Lake Mead approaches those thresholds, the consequences do not arrive as a single dramatic shock. They arrive far more quietly, through small adjustments, through decisions that look reasonable on paper, step by step. The logic of abundance is replaced by the logic of prolonged scarcity. What does that mean for you? It means the most important changes rarely happen along the shoreline. They appear in far more familiar places, on your power bill, on your water costs, in the way surrounding communities must adjust budgets, services, and expectations the about long-term stability. It's the aftermath that many people do not anticipate is not the moment everything One collapses. Man grips the arm, it is the moment the system the stops tail, expecting the thing things to return to, to normal like. anytime soon. And to understand why Lake Mead is moving toward that moment, we need to begin with the first signal. The one most people can see, but very few ask the right questions about. Two. Lake Mead is quietly crossing critical lines to understand why these cracks cannot be dismissed. We need to move past first impressions and look at how the system itself is responding, not through loud warnings, but through small signals that appear consistently and grow more serious over time. The first signal is something many people have already noticed and even grown accustomed to. Lake Mead is operating outside the range where everyday infrastructure was designed to function comfortably. Marinas must be extended. Some access points are closed. In certain areas, getting to the water has become inconvenient in a repeated, routine way rather than a rare disruption. These changes are often accepted quickly because they do not feel alarming. People drive a little farther, walk a little more, wait a little longer, life goes on. But for the system, this is not a minor issue. When infrastructure no longer reaches the waterline, it signals that the reservoir has slipped out of the flexible operating zone it once had. In practical terms, Lake Mead is no longer operating with a buffer it is operating close to the limits of what was originally designed. The second signal is far less visible because it does not appear in the landscape. It appears in the language of operational reports. In recent projections, Lake Mead continues to be classified as being in a level one shortage. This is not a phrase meant for the public. It is a technical designation used only when a reservoir is no longer considered to be operating under normal conditions. Once a reservoir enters shortage status, the decision-making framework changes immediately not emotionally, but procedurally, old assumptions are removed. More cautious scenarios take priority. 
Every new decision is weighed against a single question. If water levels do not recover, what happens next? This creates a chain reaction that few people notice. When a shortage persists, the system begins to normalize it. Measures once considered temporary become routine, and it is this normalization that deserves the most attention. The third signal is where the story moves beyond water management and into a broader sphere. Lake Mead is not only a reservoir, it is also part of the power grid. Hoover Dam depends directly on the lake's water level to maintain the pressure required for hydroelectric generation. When water remains low for extended periods, power output declines. This is not speculation. It is a documented reality in Federal Energy reports, not only at Lake Mead but across hydroelectric systems throughout the United States. And here, the system begins to speak in numbers. Without emotion, without metaphor, there is a clearly defined water level, 950 feet. That is the minimum elevation at which Lake Mead can continue generating electricity in the way the, the system is accustomed to. Like soap Below that threshold, its folds power from like Hoover Dam does not disappear its overnight, red slit of an but it no longer operates slow, as it once purposeful did. Breaths, Pressure drops, at a life output form declines, and difficult decisions begin to surface. It is important to be clear to avoid misunderstanding. This video is not saying Lake Mead has reached that level. It is saying Lake Mead is being managed under prolonged shortage conditions and the system has already identified the boundaries that will trigger mandatory actions if water levels continue to fall. When the cracks on the lake bed are placed next to the number 950 feet, their meaning changes. They are no longer just signs of dry sediment. They become visual evidence that Lake Mead is approaching rigid operational limits, where everything begins to be measured by thresholds and probability. And from this point forward, the story is no longer about how the cracks formed. It becomes a more practical, more personal question. What happens when a system that millions of people depend on begins operating not on abundance, but on limits? 3. Why these cracks aren't a sudden disaster Before we go any further, one thing needs to be made clear, not to soften the story, but to lock it into the right place. Because when images of these cracks appear, a lot of people have the same natural reflex. They jump straight to extreme scenarios, an earthquake, subsidence, a sudden incident, loud and dramatic, with a clear date and time. That reflex is understandable, because people want something they can name, something they can circle on a calendar. But if we let that feeling lead, we lose the one thing that makes an investigative story truly frightening. Precision, and sometimes precision is exactly what sends a chill down your spine. Physically speaking, many of the cracks exposed on the bottom of Lake Mead can be explained by a familiar mechanism. When mud and water-saturated sediment sit wet for a long time and then dry out, they shrink, the surface layer loses cohesion, and breaks apart into clearly defined cracks. This is not rare. It has appeared in drained reservoirs, in wetlands after water recedes, and in areas that once depended on seasonal flow. So what does that mean? It means the cracks by themselves are not proof that a geological disaster is unfolding. In many cases, they are simply signs of a simpler, heavier truth. The water has dropped far, and it has stayed low for a long time. Not a moment, but a span long enough that the sediment has to change shape under new conditions. And this is the point many people miss. A major shock can make you panic for a few days, but a prolonged shift can make you adapt without realizing it. It quietly turns something that once felt abnormal into something that feels normal. That said, none of this means the area has been ignored or left unmonitored. Quite the opposite. Lake Mead sits in a geological region that has been studied closely for decades. Fault systems around the area have been identified, mapped, and included in long-standing risk models, including structures near Hoover Dam. Those studies exist to draw the line between and in what that is possible pause, and what is only disturbingly human. If there is Scaled concern about seismic activity, tight over bone, the data speaks like first. Fluttering Earthquake the activity in the region is recorded, like something updated, and published publicly. And what matters here is not whether something is being hidden. What matters is this. When a truly major geological event occurs, it cannot stay silent. It leaves signatures in the numbers. It leaves a chain of signals that monitoring systems will detect. So the cracks on the bottom of Lake Mead need to be placed back in their proper position. They are not a warning that something will happen tomorrow. They are surface evidence of a reservoir that has dropped deeply and for long enough that the lake bed is beginning to look like a new kind of land. And putting them in the right place makes this story more important, not less because when you remove the sensational scenarios, what remains is a colder reality. A massive system is changing the way it operates, not because of a single blast, but because the foundation has shifted. The thing you should fear is not the moment the ground splits open, 
It is the moment operating agencies begin to look at Lake Mead in a different language. Official reports do not talk about an incident. They talk about prolonged shortage. They do not talk about an immediate crisis. They talk about management under cautious scenarios. That language sounds dry, but it is the clearest signal that the system is preparing for a new normal, where abundance is no longer the default assumption. And this is what you need to hold in your mind as we move into the next part. When a system begins adjusting to prolonged shortage, the first impacts rarely show up in a laboratory or on a geological map. They show up in daily life, in small, steady ways, and in ways that make it hard to point to a single date and say, everything started that day, not through one major shock, but through quiet changes, changes that many people only notice once they have already become normal. Four, how this ends up on your bills. From this point on, the story steps away from the reservoir and moves straight into everyday life. Because when Lake Mead begins to be managed through thresholds and shortage scenarios, the first thing affected is not the scenery. The first thing that changes is the set of numbers that shows up month after month inside your home. Start with electricity. For decades, hydropower from Hoover Dam has been considered a stable and relatively affordable supply for the West. It works quietly. You do not have to think about it. But hydropower follows one simple rule. It needs water. When water levels stay low for a long time, pressure drops and power output drops with it. When a familiar source produces less, the shortfall does not simply disappear. It has to be made up, sometimes with electricity purchased from elsewhere, sometimes with other fuel-based sources. And in many cases, those replacement sources are not as inexpensive as hydropower. For most people, that shift is rarely explained in detail. It shows up in a very ordinary way, in small lines of text on your bill. At first, it looks like a minor adjustment, a seasonal surcharge, a Quiet total that is slightly higher than sunset. last year. The creature drags Not big enough to cause panic, it's but enough to make you start sharp, paying attention. Snaps. And when it's it repeats year once, after year, as if tracking the feeling of stability the begins to wear down. If you live on a fixed budget, you understand this clearly. A small increase in your electric bill rarely stands alone. It pushes other decisions, running the air conditioner less on the hottest days, delaying a repair, thinking twice about expenses that used to feel normal. Not because you changed your lifestyle, but because the baseline cost has shifted, water follows a similar path. But even more quietly, when Lake Mead is placed in a prolonged shortage condition, water management can no longer rely on the assumption that things will return to normal soon. The system must spend more on monitoring, on adjustments, and on projects designed to adapt to low water levels. Those costs do not arrive as a shock. They filter through layers of management and then appear in the most familiar place, your water bill. It might show up as service fees, seasonal adjustments, new line items you have never seen before. Each one on its own may not feel large, but together they create a very specific feeling. The basic cost of living is no longer standing still. What matters is that this process can unfold without a single emergency announcement. No sirens, no clear moment when you can say, everything changed starting today. It happens through procedure, through regulations, and because of that, it becomes very difficult to challenge or reverse quickly. This is what many people do not expect when they look at cracks on the bottom of Lake Mead. Not an immediate disaster, not one major shock, but a chain of small, reasonable adjustments that lasts long enough to change how you spend and how you feel about stability. And once a system shifts into scarcity logic, it rarely snaps back quickly because decisions are no longer driven by a feeling that this year looks better. They are driven by projections, probabilities, and long-term risk avoidance. That is why the story of Lake Mead does not stop at the shoreline. It travels along power lines. It travels through water pipes. And eventually, it stops right at your front door in the form of numbers you cannot ignore. The system is already adapting. When a large system begins operating under prolonged shortage, its response is rarely panic. Instead, it adapts slowly deliberately, and often in ways that make it hard for people to notice that a new state is quietly being accepted. Lake Mead is no different. Rather than waiting for water levels to return to what they once were, managing agencies have begun preparing for the possibility that low water may become the norm. The National Park Service uses a very neutral term for this process, sustainable low water access planning. It sounds like a routine service improvement project, but its real meaning is far more direct. The system is being adjusted to function long-term with less water. That shift is clearly visible in the infrastructure around the lake. 
Marinas are no longer repaired under the assumption that water will soon return to former levels. Instead, they are extended, relocated, or redesigned to match lower water elevations. Some access points are closed permanently, not because of immediate danger, but because maintaining them under the new conditions no longer makes financial sense. These changes are not announced as a major turning point. They appear in planning documents, assessment reports, and budget decisions, but that quiet rollout is exactly what makes them significant. The system is not treating this as a temporary situation. It is investing in a long-term scenario. When baseline assumptions change, other decisions follow. Investment priorities shift. Solutions once considered short-term become standard. And with each adjustment, returning to the old state becomes more difficult. For communities around Lake Mead, this adaptation brings very real changes. Recreation adjusts, tourism adapts, some services become more expensive, not because demand is increased, but because operating under low water conditions costs more than before. Here is the key Anything point to recognize. Caught, mouth when a large a system begins patching itself to live with scarcity, the it is slide, not just reacting the to the present. And every it is laying the groundwork you can for the almost future under a very reacting. specific logic. Avoid a major shock by accepting smaller, long-lasting changes. And that logic leads us directly to the final part of the story. Because once a system has adapted to shortage, the real surprise is no longer how much lower the water might go, but how quickly these changes begin to feel normal. Sex, the aftermath nobody was watching for. When you step back and look at the full picture, the most important change is not the cracks on the bottom of Lake Mead. Those cracks are just images. What is truly shifting is how the system has begun to live with scarcity. The aftermath many people did not expect is not a sudden disaster, not a widespread blackout, not dry faucets. It is a quiet transition, where thresholds once treated as emergencies begin to be managed as normal conditions. As Lake Mead is managed around prolonged shortage, the entire system behind it adjusts. Water is allocated more cautiously. Power is calculated more tightly. Decisions are no longer based on the assumption that next year will be better, but on the probability that difficult conditions may continue. And that shift in assumption is the real turning point of the story. Because when a system stops expecting a quick recovery, it begins passing risk costs onto the end user. Not through major announcements, not through sudden shocks, but through small, reasonable, long-lasting adjustments. Adjustments that slowly become the new baseline of daily life. Seen this way, the cracks on the bottom of Lake Mead do not signal an apocalypse. They signal a new living condition, one where water and electricity do not disappear but are no longer assumed to be as cheap or as stable as they once were. This is the part worth thinking about. When you grow used to slightly higher bills, when you adjust your usage habits without being told, when infrastructure is rebuilt for low water as the default, that is when the aftermath has already arrived, even though there was never a single moment you could point to and name. Lake Mead, in that sense, does not collapse. It quietly changes roles, from a symbol of abundance to a test of how a society adapts to limits and the cracks you see on the lake bed are simply where that story first becomes visible. The data used in this video comes from federal agencies and established scientific reports. All sources are listed at the end of the video, so you can review them yourself. Thanks a lot for sticking with us till the very end. If you found this video useful, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe so you won't miss any of our daily uploads. And now, go ahead and explore some of our top recommended videos popping up on your screen. Goodbye, and see you in the next one.